Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's weekly recap video. Before I get into the videos um, and questions from the videos, I wanted to give you an update on my amaryllis that I showed you last week. So last week I noticed that this amaryllis was starting to bloom. It had this bloom right here, which wasn't even fully open and it's now fully open. But since last week, it has opened a second bloom. There's a third one starting right here that's a little bit bigger. And when I look down in here, there's a fourth, fifth and sixth bloom starting to form. Check that out. I don't know if you can see those in there, but there are buds down in that short little stubby stalk. It's just the weirdest thing because this amaryllis bloomed for us at Christmas time beautifully. It had, I want to say this one, I think it was this one, had two or three stalks full of blooms. Um, and the only thing I've done with these is I put them out here when it was still fairly cold. So they went from a warm house out here to cold. Maybe it figured it was in its cold treatment. I don't know. Then <laughs> it decided to push blooms. Um, but none of my other ones are showing any signs of blooming. So just kind of this fun treat. And I'll give you an update from week to week on how it's doing. Okay, so let's get right into the videos. The first one was grass maintenance, what we fertilize with and how often. We were getting ready to apply fertilizer and gypsum to our grass. So we figured it would be a good time to kind of go over what we use on our lawn and how often. So Aaron went through the whole schedule because it's kind of Aaron's baby. He takes care of the grass that way, which I'm thankful for. And it looks so good all the time, like pretty much all the time, except for when it gets real hot, wouldn't you say, Erin, it kind of suffers a little bit? Yeah. But we haven't had that yet this year, so it's still looking like really beautiful right now. First question was, uh, what? I thought gypsum is alkaline, what's in it? I say alkaline and I think a lot of people say alkaline. Do you know what is proper? Is alkaline oh, proper? Know, look it up. Alkaline. Every time I say it, like I have this check, like I know it's wrong, but that's how we say it in our area. So you'll have to forgive me because I'll just probably say alkaline this whole time. I really wish I would have explained gypsum better in the video, to be honest with you. There were quite a few questions about it because what I stated about gypsum wasn't technically correct. So gypsum is calcium sulfate. I stated that it lowers pH. It does not technically lower the pH of the soil. It is pH neutral. However, when you add gypsum to the soil, it does simulate some of the same benefits as lowering pH does. So let me explain. When you have high alkaline soil like we do here, you may have nutrients in that soil, like let's say iron, but because of the high alkalinity, it binds up the nutrients in a way that your plants cannot utilize them. They can't take them up and use them. So you may have plants showing uh, chlorosis or an iron deficiency. And so you think, well, I need to add iron to the soil and you can do that. And it's kind of like a quick treatment or almost like a band-aid. like your, your plants will take it up and probably improve a little bit, but then they'll quickly start showing it again because you're not addressing the problem at soil level. Um, so really the best thing you could do is really working on lowering that, that soil pH and that's really helpful. Gypsum does condition the soil and it helps unlock some of those nutrients. So while it doesn't technically lower the pH, it does condition the soil in a way that allows some of those nutrients to be utilized by your plants. And I did talk with the Spoma about gypsum and they kind of broke it down for me. Um, so they said in certain soil environments, it can improve soil structure, which for me, like in our old garden, it certainly did you know, it helped break up our really like boggy clay soil. And it took a lot because calcium or the gypsum, excuse me, doesn't stay forever in the soil. So you have to be very consistent about adding it in. But after like two seasons even, I saw such a dramatic improvement in the structure of my soil. And all of a sudden I had earthworms, I had well, uh, better drainage. So that was awesome. They also said it provides both calcium and sulfur that are minor plant nutrients. It's generally considered pH neutral meaning it does not materially impact soil pH. There is controversy over this. I've seen papers presented showing both sides of the discussion, but the general consensus, consensus is that it, it is pH neutral, neutral. Gypsum can also displace sodium in saline soils, reducing soil salts that can be harmful to plants. So all of that said, I think having a soil analysis done really in all situations is the best way to start out. Like have a soil sample, like send it off, have it um, analyzed so that you know exactly what your soil is lacking and exactly what you need to add in because it's likely that many of you would never need to add gypsum to your soil. If you live in my immediate area, you could absolutely use gypsum and it's super, super helpful, but it's very nice to know, like kind of have a baseline knowledge of what your soil makeup is so that you know going forward what will actually benefit your plants. Next question was from Robin. Do you ever aerate your lawn? My husband just retired and I plan on putting him to work on our lawn. Um, we do not aerate our lawn. Have we ever aerated our lawn? It's just not really a general practice done in our area. 
some, some people do it. I've seen some people. Like, like on soccer fields and yeah. like schools and yeah. stuff. But like at a, at a residence, have you seen like individual private homes do that? Not a lot. I haven't either. I know that that's really popular somewhere, some, pla <laughs> some places. Uh, next question, actually, no, this was a statement, was from Susan Carr. She said, with all due respect, but why aren't you telling people how to grow vegetables in their gardens and for people who live in apartment blocks with outside balconies, have you ever seen Ice Age Farmer and AMTV that there's a world crisis going on with food, never mind nicely manicured lawns that won't feed them nice? Wake up. And I included this because I think that there are several people that hold that opinion and I can totally understand where you're coming from. However, I think, and I don't know like Susan where you live and what kind of uh, environment is around you, but I come from an agricultural community. My perspective is wildly different because we can travel for days and it's all food production. Like our whole area is food production. And like even with like the whole crisis that went on with the pandemic this spring, I mean, farmers were giving away food. Like they couldn't even find homes for all their potatoes and onions and all that stuff. Um, so I kind of view things just a little bit differently. And I also love our lawn. <laughs> like I, for me, it's not a waste because I think there's some situations like parks and things where people can come together and have like birthday parties and barbecues and their kids can play on the equipment. And it's this nice like environment for people to foster relationships and create that peace. I think that's really needed. For me, that's needed in my garden. And we also do quite a bit of food production. Like last night I planted 250 feet of corn, which is way more than the three of us need. And I plan to give all the excess to the food bank. Um, and so I think that if you, I don't, I would, I don't judge either way. Like if you want to have a lawn and not produce food, whatever, like you do you and uh, you need to enjoy your garden. But I always feel like, you know, if I can produce extra and like bless other people because I feel like I've been greatly blessed. I don't know. I think it's a, for me, I don't know. I don't want to get too far into that, but I just do Aaron's laughing at me. I'm so bad at it. Like, I don't know. I don't ever want to come at things in the defense or because I like, I understand where you're coming from. And I just think it's good to everybody listen to everybody else's like everybody has a different world perspective. I don't know. It's what makes the world go it, around. It is. It is what makes the world go around. And those kinds of things do not like upset me to read that. I mean, Susan started out with all due respect, like, totally don't mind those types of comments and I think they get conversation started. Um, but I think everybody has their own perception of what is going on. And um, I think we should all try to help out if we can, which we do. I grow so much food here that we could never eat and we do try to donate all that we can that's extra. I do give a lot away to friends and family as well. So anyway, I don't think I answered that very well, but it is what it is. Let's move on to the next question. Christy said, also we're here for all of Aaron's bloopers. <laughs> That video was so hard to get off the ground because Aaron was making such inappropriate jokes. That's how he was trying to be funny. And that's why I was like, don't be funny because that's this is not the time. You were being a total boy. April Bird 4 said, I'd like to know more about applying gypsum to the flower beds as you plant. I have terrible clay soil. When it gets really wet, it's like goop. I feel ya. I've been there. You can't do anything with it. Then when it's dry, it's like cement. I can't even dig. I'm always amending with compost. I still plan to do that, but I bought a bag of gypsum after hearing you talk about it and want to get a better idea at, about how to work with it, like in terms of flower beds. So this is how I do it. When I'm prepping a new flower bed, the compost is great. Keep adding in compost and things like that. Um, any of those organic elements that you can add back into the soil to help create some loft is really good. Um, when I have a bare flower bed, I usually spread compost and gypsum and then we usually till it at least once in the beginning to till in all those things. Um, even adding it onto the top of the soil and just scratching it in lightly helps. And once you water too, it helps push all of those things down into the soil eventually. But with gypsum, it's adding it all the time. So you might do it when you initially do your flower bed. You've got this blank flower bed, you've worked it into the soil. Later on that season, let's say you have things planted in that bed, you can go in and go around all the stuff and sprinkle more in, scratch it in, water it in again. A lot of times I just put it in my broadcast spreader though, and just, I've got a little push one and I'll just push it into the flower beds and let it broadcast over the top of the soil and then it works its way down. And then whenever I plant anything new, I usually toss a handful in the bottom of the hole. And then I know at least at the bottom of the hole where the roots are, um, it's helping, like it's starting to work down there so that the roots have a chance to reach out instead of meeting like this super hard outer wall. So anyway, that's what I do. 
Second video was installing drip tape and planting some things I started from seed. That video was a beast. It was so hot that day. And Aaron and I had started installing the drip tape. We had like a couple runs done and we just needed to finish that rectang rectangular area so I could start planting. I had so many things in the greenhouse, I still do, that need to be planted out there. And those poor things, like I just, I feel so bad for all my plants because they languished for so long in the greenhouse because we didn't have water. And then I just like threw them out there on a super windy day and it was hot. And so they weren't really like, they were acclimated to heat, but they weren't acclimated to the full sun. Like they had been protected by shade cloth and I didn't like move them out gradually. I did not harden them off like I should have anyway. They don't look that good and I'm hoping that they survive. We'll see. Kendra said drip tape moves a couple inches off center. Laura, it's chaos. <laughs> oh, that drip tape is kind of chaos. I feel like I'm pulling it straight every day. It's the heat. The heat like kind of wobbles and like warps that uh, poly tubing to where it just kind of pulls it all over the place. And I think it's going to be, I, it might be like that all season. I don't know. I'm kind of hoping once some of my crops are shading it, that it will stop doing that. Who knows? It's watering great though right now. Like it's just, it's doing such a good job that I have no complaints. Uh, Gail said, does the black poly send hot water to your plants? If so, isn't that hard on your plants? So we are watering either early in the morning, in the evening, or during the night um, because it would be boiling hot water coming out of those pipes at least for a little while, you know, while it flushes out whatever water was sitting there from the last time you watered and that wouldn't be good for the roots of your plant. So we try to water when it's cooler out. Linda said, we too have moved and are starting with simul similar situation. Just wondering where you ordered your drip tape from. Is it Drip World? Is drip, that? Drip Depot. Drip Depot. I think that's it. Okay. I'll put, we'll put something on the screen for sure with what it was. Okay. He'll make sure you know. And then also, where did you get your tomato cages? Those are Titan tomato cages from Gardener Supply. And so far, they are awesome. It's my first year using them and I'm loving them. I've got 30 of them out there. Tomatoes are growing great. Uh, Natalie said, you've worked your soil so well around your house that I'm still surprised by the quality of soil on the new property. Will look great in no time. What are your top tips to improve soil? So for us now, for everybody, like I just explained, it's gonna be different. So you want to, unless you kind of know, like I have a general knowledge of what kind of soil we're dealing with here. So I kind of know how to attack it. If you don't have any idea, get a soil analysis done so that you know what to add. But what we're going to do, we're going to have the co-op, we have a farmer supply co-op that they can come and deliver like a truckload of gypsum. And then we're going to have truckloads of manure brought in as well. And that's how we're going to work up our soil for our new cut flower garden area. Compost. You said compost? Manure. You don't do, not want to do compost? Compost, yeah. so we don't stink our neighbors out. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's probably a good idea. Manure is great though too. If you can get aged manure, we were watching videos of big trucks that spray manure <laughs> out the back, and then we were thinking of all of our neighbors like liquid manure. It's so gross. I mean, it was so good for the soil. But okay, so we're gonna do compost and gypsum, and we will probably be adding that in at least twice a year um, for a while. Although my dad was out here the other day, and he was walking through the garden. He's pretty knowledgeable on things in this area. I mean, he's been in the agricultural industry since he was 17. Um, and he was walking through that garden space. He's like, this soil isn't that bad. Like, I think you're gonna do pretty good with this soil. So while it appears to, to be pretty bad, I've been super nervous about it. Like that gave me a little bit of encouragement to hear from him who knows a lot um, that he thinks it'll be okay. And my tomatoes are growing great. Everything's growing great so far. Um, so, I mean, I'm still praying that I get some produce, but anyway. Yeah, we are planning on gardening in this temporary space this year, of course, because we're already gardening there, and then probably next year as well, while we slowly work on really preparing the soil and dealing with the weeds properly in the area where we're gonna keep this space permanently. We've learned so much this year just from attacking it, <laughs> just attacking it, and learning along the way, like, ooh, we're gonna really have to research how to take care of all these puncture vines. Like, how are we gonna take care of these in the new space? So it's been a really, really eye-opening learning experience for both of us. Michael said, uh, just wondering if you could walk us through your process of, process of determining how long to keep your drip tape on for. How do you determine if it should be on for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour or longer? Um, and it, it can change through you know, the course of the year. What we do is we typically run a new drip line for what is that, like 30 minutes. We start with 30 minutes. We see what the coverage is like. If we feel like the coverage is great and it's really like, in the, uh, in the areas we want it to be saturating, then 30 minutes might be great. Like right now, I'm usually running the uh, water for about 45 minutes to an hour. I set my phone alarm for an hour 
and then uh, I'll kind of go check on it periodically. It's just a learning curve right in the beginning, just to keep an eye on stuff and um, just determine how much water is actually coming out. And then when it gets cooler, you can just back off a little bit on it. Um, I did ask Erin because I did see some comments, which I don't think I included, but whether or not you could uh, bury drip tape or mulch over it. And he said that you can. Some people do. Yeah, some people do, which might help with the temperature and all those sorts of things. Um, I didn't really want to go to that effort in a temporary space, to be honest, and I might regret that. But well, and we're new to it, so we don't know. We don't know anything about drip tape. So being able so to visually we need see, to be able to see how much water is coming out. Yeah, I, I'm assuming that if drip tape is going to work out for us, and we decide to go that route, which it's way less expensive, it won't hold up as long as the actual brown drip tubing. But if we like get really knowledgeable on it and decide that we are comfortable, we'll probably bury it. I'm guessing. I don't know though, because we're gonna probably want to remove all of it to work the soil again. Unless you do no-till. I'm not super interested. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next is Elizabeth. Uh, my husband and I love your videos. Just a quick question or two on the drip tape. Does a drip tape have to be laid in rows of three? No, you can lay it in as many rows as you want. The reason why I did three is because I kind of wanted to plant in blocks, if that makes sense. So I didn't want to have like a little itty bitty one row of drip tape with my little uh, flowers and then have a big bunch of walking space and then one other row. If we block plant like that, I can still easily reach across three rows of flowers or however many we decide to do. Um, or you could even do four, like you do one on the outsides and then two in the middle of those three runs because the water saturates fine. Um, but I think it's a better use of space in this situation. The other question was, does it work in the beds if beds are more circular? No, you cannot bend or curve the drip tape. It needs to be run straight. Um, and I did see that question often, like some people were like, oh, I should just snake that around in my flower beds. It doesn't work like that. You have to do it in a straight kind of a grid. So it needs to be a square or just long runs, that sort of thing. There are um, elbows, like there's elbows and straight couplers and tees, just like your normal drip tape. It's just that you can't curve it. Like you can, but you shouldn't be curving your drip tape anyway. I, just, I wouldn't or mess your... with them in a flower bed. Yeah, I just, wouldn't mess with I just don't think it would hold up long enough no. with our, I mean, we have hard water, we have yeah. extreme heat for the most part. Um, I just feel like drip tape isn't as long a term of a solution. Get the dig corp or the rainbird stuff. You heard it from the master. He's been working on his uh, outline, by the way, guys, for the irrigation video. Uh, Carla said, can you winterize or blow out drip tape the same way you would with the other irrigation systems at the house? You don't need to blow out any drip well, irrigation. Water just seeps out of it. it. Yeah, you don't need to blow out anything. Mm -hmm. Drip systems don't need to be blown out. Sprinkler systems do. You should disconnect it. You should yeah. like unplug. Yeah, unplug it from the water source so that yeah, if, if any, if it, there's any little bit of water, it yeah. can't back up into the system. If you've got it plugged into your faucet, mm -hmm. just unscrew it. That's it. Okay. All right, next video was adding a little instant color to the cut flower garden. Debbie said, how do you decide where to start with such a vast space? I don't know. Why did you decide to plant in row crop formation? So out there, I just wanted row crops because it was easier. It's easier with the drip tape. Um, and then as far as where I started, it is just kind of willy-nilly <laughs> this year. Like I planted some proven winter stuff in one corner. I've got my other plants in another corner. I planted 250 feet of corn, but I did it in blocks. In the other corner of that same space, it's just like wherever I have space, that is where I will plant things. I'm sure we'll get more organized as we go. Cynthia said the flower arrangements at the end are gorgeous. Thank you. Do you still have pics of them? What flowers are used? So if you go to YouTube and type in garden answer cut flower arrangements, we have done a few videos on them. I don't know if it's the exact ones that you saw in the pictures at the end of this video, but you can also follow us on Instagram. I do post a lot more stuff. Like if I make a flower arrangement just in an evening where I'm not actually filming, um, but I think it turned out pretty, I'll take a picture of it and then list out what I have in that arrangement. So if you follow us there, then um, you might find those pictures that we included in the video and more. Antonia said, I love how calmly this video is filmed. The music during the planting part, did Aaron edit this? No, so Ken edited that. Aaron filmed it and I love the music and the style that Ken edit edited that video with. Like I almost thought I could just cut out me talking the whole first part of the video and just like have this beautiful kind of montage of me planting these flowers with that really soothing music. I thought I did a really good job on that video. Annette said, can you sometimes show how you cut the flowers for bouquets, i.e. the salvia? Do you cut the flower spike or greenery, greener, greenery with it? It depends on how long I need the stems to be. Uh, and so sometimes there'll be some leaves on it, which you have to strip off whatever leaves um, are on the stem part that needs to be in the water because you don't want any leaves in the water. 
Um, but we'll probably do, now that we have, we'll have much more opportunity to show you a lot more cut flower arrangements, um, we'll probably do some more like, I don't want to say educational because I'm not a professional florist, but uh, my mom was. So I have a few things to impart, I guess, that I've learned throughout the years. Uh, next question was from Steve. Do you get your Proven Winners flowers from your parents' garden center or from Proven Winners directly? Kind of both. Like we get a lot from my parents' garden center, mostly fill-in stuff, but we, since we have a partnership with Proven Winners, we put it in order. Like I try to organize my brain enough to kind of know what I want to do the next year. Um, and we put it in order early, like November, December for the next year. And so what happens, and this is kind of like true of everybody, there's growers who grow on Proven Winners plants and they have to order little tiny plugs. They get trays of plugs from Proven Winners. So the plugs come from Proven Winners, they go to a grower, which we have a grower in Boise, it's Olson's Greenhouse, they do a fantastic job. They grow on all of the stuff that we ordered and then they bring it to us, which is awesome. And they're wonderful people. Like they let us come over whenever we want to check on them. Like we went over, we took a trailer over cause I just wanted like a handful of flats of things to use early. Um, so they're like, yeah, come whenever you want. And you can just kind of look over your stuff and see when you want to take whatever home. And then they bring out whatever is left later on. So that's how we get our plants and really anybody can do it. Like if you wanted to start your growing operation, you would do it the same way. You would order plugs from Proven Winners and they would send you these trays of little tiny plants and you would need probably to have something heated. Like we couldn't do it here unless we had the proper setup. It would be cool. Like if we had the proper greenhouses and all the heat, I'm looking at Aaron like, hey, hey. Um, that would be really fun to be able to do. But it's also kind of nice to have somebody who's professional who knows what they're doing because a lot of times like plants have to be treated really specifically. Cro all the crops are different. different. Some have to be treated with growth regulators so they don't like blow up in their cans and get huge and stringy and uh, lanky and stuff before they're ready to go out to retail. There's a lot of nuance like that goes on. I don't know if that's the right word. There's a lot of details that go on in the growing field that I just can't even begin to imagine. I like to get the plants and they're ready to go. It's all interesting though. But anyway, there's like a pop-up greenhouse just down the road from us and they've got what, three or four greenhouses and they do exclusively proven winners. And so they do that. They order the plugs, grow them on, and then they are just open for as long as their plants last and then they close for the year. So it's really interesting. It doesn't have to be large scale or anything. Anyway, it's probably not exactly what you were asking, but <laughs> you got more than you bargained for there. Uh, next video is really hoping all these plants don't die. I think that some of them will. <laughs> So I just needed to get more stuff out of the greenhouse planted, a bunch of things that I had started from seed, two flats of which I was rotting out because I didn't realize that I had these snapdragons, which 72 count trays, two of them. So what, 144 plants. Um, they were sitting on the ground, so I didn't really like notice the trays they were sitting in. They were watertight, they didn't allow water to drain, and I noticed they were starting to wilt one day. And I'm thinking, well, they're in these tiny little you know, six packs, so of course they're wilting because it's hot not really realizing that they were wilting because I was giving them too much water. And so, but I just kept watering because I thought, well, wilted, here's more water. And so I was not correcting the problem. I was making it worse and they look bad right now. They look pretty bad out there. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna give them another week or two and we'll see, I might just pull them. Um, anyway, I just needed to get stuff planted and they're out there looking great. Keely said, have you ever done any rainwater collection to help water your plants? No, we get an average of about nine inches per year like your mom has a rain barrel and it, if we get it like a goalie washer of a storm, it might fill, it might fill, but it's like once, I don't know, maybe she could enlighten me on how many times or how it's much. Such a tiny amount of water. Yeah. Like for our scale, it wouldn't even be worth it. Um, next question. Did I just see the framework for the high tunnel? Yes, it is up and it's com almost completed. They need to do a little bit of trimming of like the shade cloth and stuff on the ends. But it's amazing, you guys. It's just like a simple high tunnel. It's not even, it's like not permanent. There's little rebar stakes that go into the ground and then you put these, uh, what are they called? They're this, the Gothic oh. arch bows. Um, you slide them over the rebar. So that's how they're anchored in the ground. There's no concrete or anything like that. Like our other greenhouse is concreted into the ground. Um, but we wanted everything to be temporary and easily easy to move because it's not our permanent space. Um, so got, they got the whole frame up and plastic over it, shade cloth, but the walls aren't complete. So there's air going through underneath the walls and then the ends are both open and it creates just enough shade. Like you step in there from like this blazing hot garden out there, no shade, no reprieve from the sun, but you step in there and it's like way cooler, but it's bright. And we plan on, I was gonna grow my dahlias in there and I decided not to do that. I'm gonna grow them right outside the high tunnel. I think what we're gonna do, and this was Aaron's original plan anyway, we put landscape fabric on the whole ground so that it's not a muddy mess in there, but we're going to carry over or 
I, I don't know if carryover is the right word, but uh, house, house our, our extra plants. plants. We have a lot of perennials and shrubs that are just sitting around our greenhouse unorganized. They're hard to water because they're all clustered together. Nothing's getting the proper airflow over there um, because we just don't have enough space. So we're going to move a bunch of them over here and set them up on a drip system and just put them on the landscape fabric. And they'll still get morning sun, afternoon sun, but they'll get a lot of reprieve from the sun during the day. And when you have plants and plants in cans, even if they're full sun loving plants, it's really hard to house them and keep them looking nice without a little bit of reprieve from the intense sun. So anyway, that's how we're gonna use it this year. I'm really excited about it. it actually grounded that whole space to have a structure, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Like it looks, I don't know, everything we add, it's just like, oh, it looks like that belongs there. So anyway, I'm excited about it. Jackie said, what type of liquid mix fertilizer do you use? You forgot to post. For flowers, I use the Proven Winners uh, Water Soluble Plant Food. It comes in big tubs. We just did a fertilizing video. I went over all of the synthetic things we use, all of the organic things we use, We'll link it down below if you want to learn more. Uh, Little Missy said, can your well really handle all this watering of plants? We have two wells. So there's a well specific to the new property. That's what's going to water that. And then we have a well for our current property and it handles it just fine. Uh, Ernesto said, what can we do to turn that yellow soil into black one? Is that possible? Well, we are going to work on it. And like I said, we're going to add compost, maybe a little manure, sneak a little manure in there and some gypsum. And we'll just be adding in a whole bunch of stuff like that. Erin's um, kind of scheming up where to put our compost pile and all of that stuff so we can start creating some of our own. Um, and we did leaf mulch last year just in my raised beds. And our raised beds are amazing this year, like probably the best year so far. And the way that we have treated it is that last year I did a thick layer of leaf, leaves, <laughs> leaves, <laughs> leaves. And then I did, was it blood meal that I yeah. sprinkled on there? It's kind of an activator. And then um, this spring we put in the land and sea compost and biotone starter fertilizer and my stuff. I have cabbages that are like this big and they're golden acre, which are usually like this size cabbage, but it's like everything is just growing massively in that space. So anyway, it'll, it'll be a long process, a long road, but you guys will get to see it. Next video is I'm finally planting in the moon garden. I set out to plant a bunch of stuff in the moon garden, which I ended up getting it planted, but the whole day just kind of was chaos. It was all over the place um, with things going on. My mom came over to cut all of our alliums down. And then uh, we had a, the guy who's doing our gravel lane around the new property was here, needed some stuff marked off. And um, yeah, I don't know, there was a lot going on. Rebecca said, if planted now, when should we expect the vine crops to mature? Would they be for October harvest? When is it too, when is it too late to plant for October harvest? You just want to count back. So look at whatever variety, all the varieties are different. So like right now, I'm just going to be planting dahlias, like hopefully this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, and I know that's not your question, but my point, and I planted corn last night. My point is if, if you have a long growing season and your whatever varieties you're growing fit within uh, the amount of time you have left in your season before you get your first average hard frost, then you can still grow them. So there are a lot of type of vine crops, especially smaller pumpkins and things like that, that have a very, um, very much shorter maturity day than like some of the big pumpkins. So you just want to be mindful of that. Uh, Google last, Google first uh, average frost date for your zip code, and they'll give you an average date. And then you can count back from there and figure out which varieties you can plant. But yeah, for right now, if I planted vine crops now, it would be an October harvest for sure, which would work in our area because we have a long season. Patricia said, do you know if garden centers let you order plants ahead? Next year, I want to do a formal garden with short boxwoods and other plants in larger amounts. Do you do that? Yes. If you have a specific plan for your garden that you want specific plants for, talk to your garden center as early as possible. They always appreciate when they know what to order. Um, they want to have what you need for your garden, but if you're doing a specific thing where you need a lot of something, a lot of times they're not bringing in like a bunch of one thing, you know? Uh, my parents' garden center brings in a ton of boxwoods because we like boxwoods. A lot of people do in our area, they do well for us. Um, but there may be areas that just don't bring in a huge number of them. So if you need, like, let's say you need 50, I don't know if that's how many you need, but a lot of times that's hard to get your hands on unless you special order. So definitely talk to them, get on their list for next season and they will thank you for it. And then you'll get what you want. Uh, Katrina said, would it, what if you put benches in the moon garden? So I've thought about that. I think that I can't put any more hard, more hardscape in there. No more pots, no more benches, no more anything like that because it will become way too cluttered. I don't like when I see 
it's just personal. Everybody has their own personal um, preference and style of garden, but I don't like it when gardens are cluttered up with too much stuff. I would rather um, have my structure in there and like those urns are the star of the show over there. Um, and really the boxwood hedging around the trees, like that's amazing. It's really turning out beautiful, but I don't want anything else to, to distract from that structure in the garden. And I think by adding more stuff, it would just be more stuff. And it would be, ugh, it'd be too chaos to me. Um, Anya said, hey Laura, with the number of seeds you put in together for the pumpkin, will you be thinning or transplanting some? I'll probably be thinning some, I don't know though. I'll, like my parents have always left like four or five vines per hill. And that's probably what I'll do just to make sure I get some kind of a harvest. And not everything I planted has come up. I think I counted 52 out of 60 of the hills have come up. And I was planting some really old seeds. Like I, I had some of those Baker Creek seeds from, uh, I don't know if they were like seven or eight years old. I don't know, they were old. So I planted a whole bunch per hole and a lot of them came up, but there's a few that didn't that really I should go in and replant something else so that I have something in that space. Um, but most of the hills came up either like three or four and so I won't have to thin them. Uh, Brenda said, what are the differences between Lobularia and Alyssum? So they're the same. Lobularia is the botanical name for Alyssum and I have a really bad habit of using botanical names. I think when you come from a garden center background and a plant background um, and you have been involved in ordering stuff, a lot of times you're ordering it under botanical name, not the common name. And Erin, like you get kind of irritated like about sprays and stuff. Like I, I only refer to stuff as the active ingredient. Like, I mean, when I worked down at the garden center, we were dealing with lots of organics, but also lots of synthetics. So I would say like, well, you could use bifenthrin or cyfluthrin on that, but you could also use like a sulfur and pyrethrin or whatever, you know, I would like throw out all these different insecticides. And he's like, what are those? Like, just tell me what the name of the is that you see on the bottle is. Just tell me to buy Captain Jacks. Right. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me to buy Spinoza. Tell me to buy Captain Jacks. So anyway, we have conversations <laughs> about such things. Uh, Diego said the arbs are looking awesome. The arbs, we have to prune the arbs hard, you guys. Okay. I don't think we will, actually. You don't think so? No, I think... I think Let me read the rest of it. I remember uh, watching the video when you first planted them. Can you measure how tall they are now? They look like they were taller than you. They are. So when we planted them, they were just at, like right at the top of that middle uh, rung. Is that what you say? Yeah, rail. Rail. And now they're like whale, whale. <laughs> I was going to say way and whale at the same time. Whale above the tallest rail on that fence. Um, the, they're over six feet tall. Yeah, for sure. They're taller than I am, most of them. I planted a few like toward the end because it was an afterthought, and so they don't match the same height, which I really wish they did, but it doesn't matter. They'll catch up eventually. We have to prune ours because um, several of them have created more than one liter. So you'll look at one of the arbs and they should be pointy. I mean, North Poles are pointy. They were not pruned properly at the growing facility where they were raised, which is a bummer. And we don't know enough about, we don't know everything about every plant. So we planted these thinking they're great. They were pointy when we planted them. We didn't realize like all the, like what to look for. And so we have some arbs that have like four liters and we, we're gonna have to pick out which one we wanna keep as a liter and we're gonna have to shear up the other three, which is gonna take out a huge bulk of what we have there, which is so sad because it like makes sense, right? When they start building another house behind us, right when the arbs start looking really thick, now we have to prune them to where they're gonna be all thin again. We'll do a video about it. It's just that when you have that happen with arbs, a lot of times, and you probably have seen it, um, if you get a heavy snow load or really heavy rains that really weigh down the branches, it'll like splay them all out. And it was doing that to some of them when we had rains this spring and we just can't have that. They need to maintain their pointiness. Last video was the video we put up this morning, maintaining roses and topiaries and then planting a flower bed. Uh, in that video, I maintained roses and topiaries and then I planted the flower bed in front of the gazebo and I'm loving it. And I really wish when I did the tour at the end of the video, it was so blown out. Like it was so bright. Yeah, it was so bright. It was hard to see the colors and stuff. It, like, I was watching it last night for the first time, like after it was all edited. And um, it was the video that we needed to put up this morning because nothing else is ready. And I was like, oh, dang, I don't even get a second chance. Because usually I'll watch something back like that. And I'm like, nope, I need to take two and get it in better lighting. But sometimes you just got to go with it. We'll share pictures of it later, what it's looking like, hopefully in better lighting. But I'm loving it. Pam said, you two are a match made in heaven, such a wonderful couple. Your garden is wonderful too. Now that comment is encouraging, isn't it? 
I love those kinds of comments. You guys are so sweet. Um, Linda said, what happens if you make a mistake and double the amount of proven winter's water soluble plant food? Uh, I don't think it would really adversely affect unless you did it all the time. I mean, you might see a little bit of tip burn on your plants or something like that, but if they're annuals that you are fertilizing, like in containers, usually there's so much water going through that it probably, they won't skip a beat. It's just not something that, like, try not to make that mistake consecutively over and over again. Uh, Kathy said, will the purple fountain grass come back for your zone five? Nope, I've been looking for a pretty grass that will come back. That one, unfortunately, does not. I wish there was a perennial grass. I mean, maybe you guys know of one that's perennial that has the same kind of appearance. I don't know of one. I really wish they could figure out how to make those perennial. <laughs> There's so much science in this land. Like you would think that they could figure out a way <laughs> to graft this grass onto a stronger root stock. I don't know, um, because it's gorgeous. They grow fast. They make a statement. I'm excited to see what they do. And honestly, like I was really resisting the urge to put vertigo back in that area because it was glorious last year. But I think I'm gonna enjoy having a shorter grass that I can kind of see across. Don't you think like I can see across to the fountain? in the quarter garden. I think it'll be a really good look and it's something different. Uh, Annabelle said, can we get a rose tour where you talk about each one and your experience with, experiences with them? I'm typically not a huge fan of roses, but yours looks so beautiful. I wanna invest, but I'm nervous. Um, I love that idea. The problem is that a lot of our roses are not in the bloom at the same time. Like you'll have one variety that's in its peak while another variety has just kind of bloomed out and it lulls out for a couple of weeks. So I, it would be kind of a lot of work to start compiling. We don't have like we have a lot of like random projects going on. So it's kind of hard sometimes to remember like, oh, we need to make sure to go out there and capture, you know, these things and the right lighting. Yeah. Like you have to have the plant look peak and you have to have the right lighting. Or we try to because it, it tremendously affects the quality of our videos, I think, to try really hard to capture things when they look the best. We can't always do it, but we try. It might seem like an easy thing to just go out and film something really quick, but it really does take like 20 to 30 minutes of getting all your stuff ready and organized to go and make sure I'm like semi clean. Like there's that too. Like usually when I start a video, I'm like, Aaron, I got to run upstairs and change my shirt or something, you know? And I don't like, I don't like fancy up for videos. I look the same all the time, but I try to like have a clean pair of pants on or something, you know, usually. So there's a lot of like prep time. And then um, there's just like thinking about it too. Like sometimes you don't really even like hone in on the fact that a rose is at its peak until it's kind of starting to go out because there's a lot going on here. Yeah, this is the last question. Maria said, why didn't you replant the sunflower in another area? The sunflowers <laughs> were a little bit of a trigger for some people, my word. So I was gonna leave the sunflowers because I thought it was serendipitous of them to just come up and look so beautiful. Uh, hindsight, they look way better being gone. Aaron was like, nah, they look like weeds in there. It's just like wrecking kind of the layering of the flower bed, we need to take them out. Um, I think there are, there's like a camp of people who are really like, they get emotional about plants, like pulling them out. I'm not such a person. And then there's other people who can just like, just deal with the garden, how it needs to be dealt with. If we were to replant those, it would be a nightmare um, because those are huge. It is hot right now. And we would be, I mean, it, they would immediately wilt. They might recover a little bit, not enough to probably bloom very nicely. Um, at the stage of growth that they were in. Had I thought about it earlier, I was just kind of enjoying them in there, but had I thought about replanting them earlier when it was cooler, we probably could have done it. It just wouldn't be worth the effort at this stage of the game. Um, so anyway, I do like that. See, it's good to have two different opinions on stuff because I would have let it stay there. I probably wouldn't have loved the look of the flower bed. Like I would have loved the sunflowers themselves, but not like how the whole flower bed was coming together. And now I enjoy it so much more. Sometimes you just need that little push, like it'll be better, trust me, to get rid of them, um, which we did. So there you go. <laughs> and that's it for today's recap. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. Hoping, hope, hoping, hoping, what is my deal? I'm hoping to go plant cheese, to plant dahlias. I don't know if I should spend any time out in the heat today. <laughs> I don't think that'd be good for me. Hoping to go plant dahlias today, mercy. It's, you know, only June, what, what is today? 22nd. It's 22nd, My, like a month and a half late on planting dahlias, but that's okay. Hopefully we get some good growth on them. We gotta go get some steaks and stuff today and get that done. So hope you guys have an awesome week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.